Um, we're going to read some more of The Little Princess um, by Frances Hudson Burnett. And it's illustrated by Thea Reros. I think that's how you say that. So as we know, um, Sarah has lost her father. Um, and she is no longer a pupil at the school, a student, but a servant. She no longer has her pretty dresses, and the only toy she has is her doll. Because she um, refused to give it up. Um, she now, instead of it in her pretty room, lives up in the attic. She no longer goes to school, but helps the younger students with their lessons. And she used to sit at the table um, and eat breakfast with them why she helped the younger ones stay quiet but her clothes and her appearance became so shabby that she was told by Miss Minchin that she needed to eat downstairs from now on in the kitchen soldiers don't complain she would say between her teeth I am not going to I will pretend that this is part of a war Sometimes Sarah would pretend to be a soldier because her father was a soldier. He was a captain in the British Army. But there were times when her heart might have broken, but for two people. The first was Becky. Throughout all the first night spent in the attic, she had felt a comfort in knowing that on the other side of the wall, in which the rats scuffled and squeaked, there was another young human creature. They had little chance to speak to each other during the day. But before daybreak, Becky used to slip into Sarah's attic and button her dress and give her such help as she needed before she went downstairs to light the kitchen fire. And when night came, Sarah always heard the knock at her door, which meant that her handmaid was ready to help her again if she needed. So Becky, knowing that poor Sarah had was used to having servants help her with things, instead of just treating her like another servant, she, even though she no longer had any money, she felt and loved Sarah so much that she was like, you know what, I'm still going to help you because I know this is hard for you. I feel, yeah, so Becky is, is uh, what you would call a great friend. The second comforter was Ermengarde. One night when Sarah went to her attic, she was surprised surprised to see a glimmer of light coming from under the attic door. She opened the door and cried, Ermengarde, you will get into trouble. Ermengarde stumbled up from her footstool. She scuffled across the attic in her bedroom slippers, which were too large for her. Her eyes and nose were pink from crying. I know I shall, if I'm found out, she said, but, but I don't care a bit. I couldn't bear it anymore. Sarah, do you think think you can bear living here? She looked around the drab room. If I pretend it's quite different, I can, she answered. Or if I pretend it is a place in a story. Other people have lived in worse places. Think of the people in the Bastille. Yes, that will be a good place to pretend about. I am a prisoner in the Bastille. I have been here for years and years, and everybody has forgotten about me. Mitch, M Miss Minchin is the jailer, and Becky is the prisoner in the next cell. I shall pretend that it will be a great comfort to me. So sometimes pretending and using your imagination can help you get through hard things, and that's what Sarah is doing. She's pretending that she is a girl in a story, like the one we're very reading right now. How You know how we go on adventures with our stories? Um... She's pretending that she is the character in the story and that she is there. And that is helping her get through this hard time. After Ermengarde had gone downstairs again, Sarah's attention was attracted by a squad, by a squeaking sound near her. A large rat was sitting on its hind quarters and sniffing the air. He looked at Sarah with bright eyes. He was very hungry. He had a wife and a large family in the wall, and he felt he would risk a good deal for a few crumbs. Come on, said Sarah. I am not a trap. 
You can have some crumbs, poor thing. Prisoners in the Bastille used to make friends with rats. Suppose I make friends with you. This just also shows how lonely Sarah really is. Even though she has Ermengarde and Becky, she doesn't get to see them very often. So to make, so she feels she's so lonely that she's making friends with a rat. He went softly towards the crumbs and began to eat. She sat and watched him without making any movement. He took up a last he took up a last big crumb for his children and then fled back into the walls, slipping down into a crack and was gone. I do believe I can make friends with him, said Sarah. Visits from Ermengarde were rare, and Sarah lived in a strange, lonely life. It was a lonelier life when she was downstairs than when she was in her attic. She had no one to talk to, and when she was sent out on errands and walked through the street, she felt as if the crowd hurrying past her made her loneliness even greater. With Melchizedek, the name she had given the rat in her attic, she had become so friendly that he actually brought Mrs. Melchizedek with him sometimes, and now and then brought one or two of his children. She wished that someone would take the empty house next door. She wished it because of the attic window, which was so near hers. It seemed as if it would be so nice to see it propped open some day and a head and shoulder rising out of the square opening. So this, um, you see right here, this window here, I guess um, he probably either here or um, over over on this side, there is a, another window that's attached to another house. Um, that is like hers, and she wishes someone would live in that empty house so she could see someone occasionally pop their head out of the window. One morning, on turning the corner of the square after visiting the grocer, the butcher, and the bakers, she saw, to her great delight, that during her long set of errands, a van full of furniture had stopped before the next house. The front doors were thrown open, and a man was going in and out carrying heavy packages and pieces of furniture. All the things looked rather grand. I suppose it is a rich family, she thought. One evening, a few days later, Sarah found it easier than usual to slip away and go upstairs after her errands. She mounted her table and stood looking out of the at the fine sunset. There were floods of molten gold covering the west. The birds flying across the tops of the houses showed quite black against the yellow light. She suddenly turned her head because she heard a sound a few yards away from her. A strange squeak. squeaking sound. Chattering dat came from the window of the next attic. Someone had come to look at the sunset as she had. There is a white swathed form and a dark with a dark face, white turban head of the native um, Indian man servant emerging from the skylight. And she, they, she means someone from India, like she was. And the sound that she heard came from a small monkey he held in his arms. As Sarah looked toward him, he looked toward her. She smiled at him. He smiled back. At the same time, he loosened his hold on the monkey, which suddenly broke free, jumping on the slates and ran across them, scattering and, and actually leapt into, onto Sarah's shoulder. The monkey ran across the roof and jumped on Sarah's shoulder. And from there down into her attic room, it made her laugh with delight. But she knew he must be restored to his master. And she wondered how this would be done. And we will find out how it is to be done next time. All right. Thank you for um, listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.